Welcome to all our campuses, Irvine campus. Come on, clap for our Irvine campus. We're live. What's up, Irvine? Welcome to all our online family, Greek Fullerton family, and then soon to come to Anaheim, but all of us are live. And when it comes to these moments, what, what just reminds me is that we serve a God that makes Christianity, the beauty of it is that the God we serve, you don't have to reach perfection for him to love you. In every other religion, you have to reach a level of perfection to reach, quote unquote, the place of he their heaven, which is false religion. Say amen. amen. You don't have to be perfect. And in, other, in other words, Christianity says, come with your broke self. He says, come with your brokenness and I will make you whole. He will bring healing. God says, bring your mess. Come on, somebody. And his love will perfect us. Say amen. Now, God loves us the way we are. He won't leave you the way you are. Say amen. Right? But he accepts us. And tonight, I want to preach a gospel presentation on the goodness of the cross. And I want you to lean in because these scriptures I'm about to share with you tonight perhaps detail what happened on the cross unlike any other text, and I'm going to choose it out of Colossians, so grab your Bibles, go with me, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, and if I get a little monitor on my microphone, that would be great, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, you can all stand to your feet, as I like to stand for the reading of God's word, so let's stand to our feet, and let's read Colossians chapter 2, we're going to go verse 13 through verse number 15, and then I got, you know, me and my props here, and you can follow along with me here, but verse 13, and we're going to read together here, the story of how the cross and what happened at the cross and how it breaks it all down. But here the Bible says in Colossians 2, it says, it says like this. It says, you were dead because of your sins. Tell your neighbor, I was once dead. I said, but now I'm alive. I said, now I'm alive. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. He says, then God made you, what does the Bible say? alive with Christ because Christianity is not about bad people becoming good Christianity is about dead people becoming alive he says you made alive in Christ and we'll come back to that in a second he says for he forgave all of your sins and the Bible's making very clear that we were all dead in sin and we needed to come alive because not everything that's dead is in a coffin <laughs> there's some walking dead like real zombies, just joking. But they're, they're walking dead. You're, you're alive, but you're not alive. And I'm going to talk to the one that needs to come alive tonight. Verse 14 says, he canceled the record of the charges or the debt against us and took it away by doing what? Nailing it where? To the cross. It says, and in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and the authorities. In other words, he took the weapons of Satan away. You got to clap right there. Come on. Man. He took it away. The Bible then says he shamed them publicly by his victory over them. Where? On the what? On the cross. The victory on the cross. The Bible says he nailed our sin, our charges, our debt to the cross. I want to talk today about how it was nailed on the cross. It was nailed on the cross. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. And tonight, God, we didn't come to hear the word of man. We came to hear the word of God. And so, Father, in this moment, we ask you to speak to us, to encourage us, to move, Father, through every heart at our Fullerton, Irvine campus, online. God, that you would begin to reveal to us the nature of how we needed you, Lord how, Father, we need to come alive. Lord, we thank you because you didn't have to come, but you did. When I could not save myself, you died on the cross for my sins. You were my substitute. You paid my debt and cleared it so that I would have a pathway to come to you, the free gift of salvation. I love you, Lord, and I thank you. And tonight, grow my gratitude for what you did. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say Amen. Give God one more clap. Tell the person next to you, say, I'm grateful for the cross. That's right. And then just say, I'm going to come alive today. Say, I'm going to come alive today. That's right. I'm going to come alive today. Good Friday is those moments that 
we get to reflect, but it really is about looking forward. You know, we thank God for what happened, but how many know God doesn't want us just to only talk about what he saved us from. He wants you to know what he saved you for. Okay. Like, like there's a purpose to this thing. There's a purpose to this thing. And it wasn't just so that we could have, you know, a religious holiday. And it's not, it's not what it's for. And it definitely wasn't to have Easter egg hunts. Come on, somebody. Amen. Now, I'm not knocking you, but how many know it's more than that? Say it's more than that, okay? If you're going to hunt for anything, hunt for salvation. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I know. Who says that? I do. All right, anyhow. That's what you need to be on the hunt. Someone say, hunt for purpose. That's right, hunt for purpose, right? But he died to give us, listen to me now, a future. Okay. He didn't just die to deal with our past and then we start defining our own future or define like our own way of living. He died to forgive us, but he also died to give us a hope and a future, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says. He came to forgive us and then watch this now and also set us free. There's a freedom to this. There's a forgiveness. And it's really summed up in the text here in this one word where the scripture says that we were dead, but then he brought us to life. And the, the inflection, church, is that we all were dead. Even though we were like eyes open, heart beating, palms are sweaty, mom's spaghetti, you know, even though, <laughs> sorry, God's working on me. Just pray for me, okay? Pray for me, pray for me. Don't judge me, pray for me. So, even though we're like functioning, the truth is we're dead on the inside. And I want to speak to that tonight. Like this Good Friday, I want to speak to that. Because I think, unlike any time in our history, we have a lot of avenues that show people, parenthetically, alive. But the truth is they're dead on the inside. We see these posts and they look alive. Y'all got your angles? Come on. Eh? My good side. I don't know what your side, I don't know what that is, but anyhow, you know? It's like we, we live in this world that, that really puts a picture of like looking alive is apart from Christ. When the truth is there is no life apart from Christ. There really isn't. I'm going to say amen right there. Amen. But, but, the, but the culture will paint you this, that, that life, that fun, that, that really being fulfilled. Man, that's, that, you got to get away from God that really have a good time. Because, I mean, if you serve God, it's like, you're like boring. You're one of those boring Christians. We haven't been to Freedom House yet. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, but just see this picture where, where, where it's like life, the world paints, is apart from Christ. But I want to tell you tonight in the front of the message that life is not apart from Christ. True life is with Christ. Say amen. It's with Christ. It's with Christ. And I want to really speak to how we come because... We have a generation that has a hole in their soul, a generation that is more medicated, a generation that is more stressed, a generation that has more at our fingertips, but yet our hearts are never more empty. We have a generation that, that is, is, is taking pills to try to find happiness. Okay? And again, I always got in my disclosures, I understand there are medical issues, and, and I'm not here to knock that, but, but sometimes I think we become more dependent on the drug. Oh, I'm preaching I'm preaching, I'm preaching. I know, I know. Come on, somebody. We, we look for the hope outside of God. Come on now. And, and, and I want to draw us back this Good Friday that the cross is enough. I want to draw us back this Good Friday that Jesus is enough. The word is enough. His salvation is enough. The spirit of God is enough. Someone say Christ is enough. And that, and that the truth is you ain't never been more alive than when you have the life of Christ. That's why Paul said, no longer I live, but Christ lives inside me. And so I, 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 I've been on this, this, this trip lately, not, not a trip, but you know what I mean, where I love to preach. I love to inspire. Like, don't get me wrong. I love to preach and I start sweating. But if you don't see me sweating, doesn't mean I'm not working, okay? I'm just, I'm teaching. I'm talking, all right? But I've been on this trip of really educating our church theological statements. I want you to know why you believe what you believe. But it's not just like, yeehaw, which don't get me wrong, we get fired up in here. I might dance too, you never know. We'll prophesy, we'll do it all. But I want you to know why you believe what you believe. Because the scripture says my people perish not for a lack of prayer. It doesn't say my people perish for a lack of passion. It says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Because if you don't know, what, what, 
What you don't know, the enemy will have an advantage over you. But when you know, you're like, hold up, hold, hold up, wait, uh uh. Devil, I know what the scripture says, and I know how to deal with you. Come on, somebody. And tonight, we're going to know how to deal with the devil because the Bible says he was disarmed at the cross. And you're going to be more caught up not on what Satan is doing, but what God is doing and how he's going to lead you in the future. You may get a good amen right there. Say amen. So the scripture talks about deadness. Say deadness. And, and, and what, it, what it means, it says that we were all dead. It wasn't talking about us being physically dead. So I want you to understand the spiritual state of deadness, spiritual deadness. Now, in your notes, write this down. If you're taking notes, write it with me. If you're not, write it down. Just you want to remember this, okay? Write this down. What is spiritual deadness? It is a few things, but spiritual deadness, number one, is blindness, is, is, to, is to not be able to see what life is really about. It's, it's being spiritually blind. I remember when I got saved, I felt like a veil was taken off the front of my eyes. I felt like I was going through life like this. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, it says that the devil, the God of this age, lowercase g, by the way. I know they're going to put the scripture up here. I hope they correct this. Okay, yeah, lowercase g. Because the Bible says the God of this age is not talking about God, Jehovah, Yahweh. It's talking about the Satan. The God of this age, the Bible says, has what has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So just leave that verse up there. I want you to see this real quick. That, that spiritual deadness doesn't mean that you're physically dead in a coffin, but you're spiritually dead because you can't see the full light of God, the full hope that is Christ. You can't see the glory, the image of God. You're spiritually blinded. And the Bible says we were all like that. And tonight, that might be where you're at. You might be in a place where you just, it just, you cannot see how serving God is better than your plan. I want to submit to you, sir or ma'am, that you're battling spiritual deadness. But here's the good news. He's come to make us alive. I said he's come to make us alive. Come on, give me an amen. He's come to make us alive. Because the Bible says that's what the, he's, the devil's good at giving you a mirage. Ooh, I like that. A mirage. Say what we say, a mirage. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. And a mirage is something that you think is real, but when you get there, it's empty. He loves selling mirages and, and illusions. And, and so the Bible says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That, that he, literally, he literally plays mind games where we are unable to see the goodness of God because of what is in front of us or what, is, what, what we need. And so let's continue. It says, verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord ourselves as a servant of Jesus' sake. Verse 6 says, For God said, let there be light, right? He says, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory that is displayed in the face of Christ. And so in other words, God says he wants to turn the light switch on. That I don't want to go through life trying to find my keys in the dark. That when I accept Jesus, that he's the light switch that turns the light on. And just like when I grew up in Section 8 housing, when you turn the light on, the cockroaches would leave. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> That's real talk. What is that? You too bougie. It's just leave. <laughs> and it wasn't because we weren't clean. My mom said I clean, but the neighbors, they just don't pick up. Like, come on, somebody. <laughs> when the lights come on, things have to flee. And that's why Jesus came, because we were blind, but now I can see. Come on, somebody. That is why if you know somebody that's spiritually blinded, pray that God turns the light on. Amen. And so the Bible says we were spiritually dead. Why? Because we were blind to Christ. And God is opening our eyes. And I don't even say it like this, because I don't have the time to go even further, further more and more in debt. But, but some of us have not yet reached the full 2020 spiritual vision. You're, you're right now, you're still seeing kind of fuzzy. So it's hard for you to serve God because you're like on life support spiritually. Lord, turn the light on. Lord, turn the light on. Christ came to turn the light on. Say amen. amen. Okay, the next thing, I got to move quick here. And so the next thing is, what is spiritual deadness? Spiritual deadness is not when you're physically dead. It's when you have hardness of heart. This is spiritual deadness. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 says, they are darkened in their understanding. It says, and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to, what does it say here, the what? The hardening of what? Of their hearts. And some of us, we have hard hearts, and that's making us spiritually dead. 
You've been holding on to that unforgiveness for how many years, and I'm just killing you. It's your spirit. You have a hard heart. You're stubborn. I always say this. Serving God has a lot to do with your pain, your pain threshold. Some of you just hold on. You're like, I don't care. I'm not going to serve God. It's like, dude, you're like, the ship is sinking. I don't care. It's like, you must like to suffer, don't you? It's, it's hard. He says, they were dead because of a hard heart. And the enemy loves to make you have a hard heart. A, heart of, a, a, hard, a hard heart of offense. Your heart is hard. So right now, even though I'm talking about Jesus, you're like mad at me right now. You're like, what, you bring me here? <laughs> God wants to heal you of your hard heart. He wants to heal you because spiritual deadness has to do with a hard heart. And for some of y'all, it's not that you have a hard heart. You have a hard head. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I think he's talking to you. Say, I think he's talking to you. Come on, sir. I think he's talking to you. Come on. Yeah, that's right. I think he's talking to you. Yeah. Say, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. You have a hard head. You ain't got a hard heart, you got a hard head. And nobody tells me, nobody tells me, nobody tells me nothing. Nobody tells me who this guy think he is with his high water pants. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> if you can't make fun of yourself, you take yourself way too soon. So. Nobody, nobody tells me you got a hard head. Nobody tells me, shoot, preacher think he is. It's, it's a hard head. You're stubborn. Nobody speaks into your life. That's a lonely place to be. It's a lonely place to be. Spiritual deadness is having a hard heart. Spiritual deadness is having a blindness about life. Come on, son. So what did Christ come to do? Ezekiel 36, 26 said, I will give you, watch this, a new heart. And I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. And what is he going to give us? A heart of flesh. Stony heart. Your father left you, so your heart's stony. Your mom disappointed you, so your heart's, you have a hard heart. Your ex broke your heart, so now you have a hard heart. God, you ain't good. How can you be good? They ruined it. Hard heart. That will, that will make your prayer life dry. You will be spiritually dead. Dead. And God didn't come just so you can have a good little church service. He came to make dead people alive. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Say amen. We're building this thing. We're building this thing. Amen. He says... Here, uh, next, let's go to the next thing. Spiritual deadness, right, is when we are incapable of serving him. And I can't go too much into this, but Romans chapter 8 and verse 8 says, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You know you're spiritually dead is when, when you live so much in the flesh, you don't even feel bad sinning anymore. You, you don't feel bad anymore. Got to say it with love and sincerity. But it's, it's really easy to be religious. God, I went to church on Friday. I'm going to take communion. We're going to take communion in a second across all our campuses. I took my communion. We good. No, we're not good. Because the most dangerous place to be is when you stop feeling conviction. Like it used to feel like I shouldn't be doing this. Now it's like I do it and what? You're spiritually dead. And he didn't come just so we could have a good little church service. He came to make dead people alive. Just to feel it. Come on, 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 come on. Amen. He used to repent quicker. He used to say sorry, Lord, quicker. It's a dangerous place to be when you no longer even feel bad. You're just like, well, you know, it's kind of how I am. Like it or lump it. No, no, there's no like it, lump it, homie. Okay. Or girls. Miss. Okay. That's just the way I am. I'm just ratchet. No, 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 no. Bougie? Ratchet. No, no. No, no. <laughs> no. Okay. You don't feel bad. It says when you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. You're spiritually dead. And I want you to look at that. Because tonight... I want to just jump and talk about the cross, but I'm like, if, if I don't present what true spiritual deadness is, there might be dead people that think they're alive and think this doesn't apply to them. Oh, that's pretty cool, Pastor. Great. Can I take my communion and go home now? And you will leave this service, the walking dead, and wonder, why, why do I... Why, 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 do, why do people talk about Christ came to give us life, but I don't have my life because you're still spiritually dead. 
And God's not okay with that. He's not okay with his kids being spiritually dead. This is how much God loves us. He loves us that he wasn't like, you just, you stay dead. God loves us so much that he sent his son, the Bible says. Read it from the text. He says that when we were dead in our sins, it didn't say when we were well behaved in our goodness. It says when I was dead in my sin. Let me me translate it for you. When you were tore up from the floor up. When you were still offended, when you were still your nasty, ourselves, I'm going to put myself, while I was still my nasty self, God said, I came to make you and provide you a way to come to life. Oh, you ought to clap if you're grateful. You ought to clap if you're grateful. You ought to clap if you're grateful. Thank you, Lord. But you came to make me alive. Because Lord knows I couldn't make myself alive. He tried to get high to find life and you weren't happier. You're happy for a little bit, yeah, but then you're sad again. You can't, you, you can't. So how is spiritual deadness solved? Write this down. Spiritual deadness is solved and I know what time it is. When are you gonna end? When I feel like it, just joking. Okay, or maybe I will. I don't, even, I don't have no other service after this. We just go all night. <laughs> just joking. Spiritual deadness is solved by being born again. Are you one of those reborn Christians? Those born again people? Yes, I am. (laughs) Because I needed to come to life. Very smart person by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus, John chapter 3, here the verse to put it up here. And he came and he asked this question to Jesus. He says, Jesus, he says, How do I go to heaven? He's like, How do I enter heaven? And Jesus replied and said this in John 3 3. He says, Verily, verily, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are what? Born again. again. To which Nicodemus replies, and you can read it for yourself, he says, how can I go back into my mother's stomach? And he says, Nicodemus, he says, what's of the flesh of the flesh? What's of the spirit of the spirit? He wasn't asking him to be born physically again. He says, you've got to be born spiritually again. In other words, I've got to take the metaphorical, you know, uh, 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 um, um, you know, and, and, and come back. I've got to make you born. Again. I got to give you a fresh start. I got to give you an opportunity to start over again. But you can't change your own life and turn over a new leaf. He's like, I'm going to make you into a whole brand new leaf because I make a new creation. And he makes, come on, somebody. You may look the same on the outside, but you're a new person on the inside. I will heal you of what is the, what is hard in you. I, I, I will show you what you cannot see. I will bring to life what you have not brought to life before. Someone ought to clap if you're born again. Someone clap like you got a fresh start. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that I was born again. And if you have not experienced this tonight, my prayer is that you experience this. That there is a way that God has allowed us to get a true fresh start. Like a for real born again moment. And he came to give us that. And I want to show you how he came to give us that. Go, go to verse uh, 2 Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm going to go verse by verse. We'll teach it for, uh, precept upon precept. It says, for you were dead because of your sins. And because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God, someone say then. then. So then God made you alive with Christ. He made us alive with Christ. So he make you alive apart from Christ. He made us alive where? With Christ. Because apart from Christ, there is no life. You can try to build a life, but it'll collapse sooner or later. Like sooner or later. I don't need, I don't need God. When you're on your deathbed, you, you will be asking someone, you'll need God. Trust. Trust. As the kids say, facts. Okay? I'm learning. Okay? You're going to need God. You can try, but sooner or later, you will have an encounter with your humanity. And that is the greatest gift God allows people that don't serve him to have. Is you will encounter your humanity, your limitation. You will realize that you can only go so far and you need God. You need God. And if you ain't there yet, live a little. You're still 18. You just live a little. Live a little. You're going to hit a certain place in your life. You're going to be like, I cannot change this woman. Trying to help the fellas out real quick. <laughs> you won't realize you need God. You're going to be like, these kids. 
going to be like, Lord, I need you. And say, my health. The doctor said they can't do nothing. You will reach your limitation. Listen to me. I'm, and I'll deposit the seed now because when that day comes, this is how good God is. He will wait for you at that moment. Amen. He's that good. I said 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 he's that good. He will wait for that moment. And some of you and some of us, I'll put myself in there because I'm, I'm not trying to point fingers. It's like this. You'll be like, and I'll never do it again, God. And there you are again. And he's still there love. How good is he? I mean, we could end the service right there. We all hit the altar and say, thank you, God, that you got me out of it. Thank you, God, for the first chance. Thank you for second chances. You ought to praise him for the third chance. You ought to praise him for the fifth chance. You, ought, you, ought to, you should have been dead by now. You should have lost your job. You're like, I hope they didn't see that. I'm going to lose my job. You, you should have been on the streets. But God, you, but God, I said, but God, in his infinite mercy, made me alive with Christ on the cross. Say amen. But he made us alive, and he's going to tell us how in this next sentence. I'll tell you, these verses are powerful. I was, I've been living in them. It says, for he, what did he be? Him being God, what did he do? He forgave. He forgave. He forgave. He, for, he forgave all of whose sins? Tell your neighbor, say, my sins. my sins. And tell him, there's a lot of them. Come on, be honest. Okay. I'm not telling you to name them, okay? Don't be like, I don't know. Okay, stop. <laughs> there's a lot. Don't act like there's only one. You know, well, when I was in third grade, I was only racist. <laughs> Whatever. Well, shave down your horns on your way out. Amen. <laughs> I only have a halo that sits on your horns. Just joking. Okay, amen. Sorry. Don't get me started, okay? Stay focused, Joseph. Say, there was a lot of them. Sometimes we read verses like this, we're like, yeah, you know, I'm talking about the sins that go deep. The failures. Let me put another word on it, because sometimes sins carries a religious connotation that we think like sins are only like certain things. Let me just put the word, insert the word failures. Failures. Where you, where you, where you failed, where you blew it. Where you blew it. God says, the way I made you alive is by forgiving those moments. Forgiving them. Not going back and changing them, but giving you a fresh start. Someone say new life. new life. He forgave me. So point number one, write this down. There's two points to this message. I'll try to move as quick as I can here with the 33 minutes I have left. Just kidding, 13. <laughs> number one, write this down. Jesus nailed the penalty of sin to the cross. He nailed the penalty of sin where? To the cross. Okay. Got some props here. Because verse 14 is going to say it like this. Go to verse 14 if you can. Colossians 2.14. And if you attend the Freedom House for any amount of time, you all know this is my mind works. And, and I just, I start seeing pictures of how to, how to illustrate this. And how I, I'm like, that's how I understand it. Maybe it'll help them understand it. And, and you know, and I, but the Bible says, he canceled the record of the charge against us. Against who? And he took it away by doing what? Okay, okay. we have a Bible study. This is Bible study, okay? We're going to have a good moment with the Lord. This is Bible study. There's, a, there's so much meat here. I am serving you a porterhouse steak right now. One side, the New York. The other side, the filet. Okay. He canceled the record of the charges. The word charges means debts. So he made us alive by counseling the record of our debts, and he took it away. And there are our sins. And so I'm going to write down all the sins on this paper of just things that we might have done. And I'm going to name them. Lying. Anybody ever lie? Just look straight. You lie like a rug. You lie like a rug. Lie like a rug. You'll get on the way home. A rug, it lies on the floor. Get it? You lie. Tough crowd tonight. Tough crowd. Disobeying. You ever disobey? Come on. 
Hatred. You ever hated anybody? You're like, you're so mad you came to church. I better stop. You're like, you got out of the car. You're like, and you're, you're like, God bless you. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. <laughs> Handle your biz. Cheating. You ever cheat on a test? You ever cheat on your taxes? I'm just going to keep going here. It's getting quiet up in here. Lust. Just write them down. Lust, you know. The Bible says that if you look upon anyone else lustfully, you commit adultery in your heart. Which then leads to our generation. Porn. Got quiet. You better not get too quiet. We're going to know it's you. <laughs> yeah. you gave yourself away. Amen. Just trying to help you. Come on. It's Freedom House. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just writing them down. That's all. I'm not. This is it. I'm just, I'm just writing it down. I, I didn't, I'm not saying nothing. I'm just. What is that? Fornication. That's a that's a, a new F word I learned when I got saved. It's like fornication. What is that? That's sex before marriage. So again, got quiet. Don't, don't get too quiet. Don't you. Sex before marriage. Well, you know, we're kind of like you know. I said I love you. I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to be married. I mean, was you know you know you know you know you're my girl. I mean, you know, I mean, let's just move in together. Let's see how it works out. God says that's sin. God can't bless that. It's just a contract. So is a deed to a house, but you sign that. So is that. Kind of important, you know? Sex before marriage. You know, you got you to gotta take the car on a test drive, see if you like it. We got all these, like, weird sayings. Like, that's a car, this is a person. Kind of more important, you know what I mean? Kind of, you know what I'm saying? Maybe a little. You know? Some will say a lot. A lot. Sex out, outside of wedlock. Right? Homosexuality. God says that's not okay. God loves you, but he says that's not okay. He said that marriage is defined between one woman and one man. Amen. We love you, but I got to tell you what God says. Amen. Today, gender confusion. Well, I think, I think, I, I'm, I think I'm a, a girl trapped in a boy's body or a boy. No. God decided what your gender was. He says he made male and he made female. And I love you enough to tell you what the Bible says. Oh, are you trying? Are you are you trying to to you know uh, uh, confuse children? No, I'm trying to help children. Because if I were to ask my my son what he wants to be, he would not. You know what he'd choose? He'd want to be Hulk. <laughs> and then the next day he wants to be Spider Man. Okay? And then the next day he wants to be you know uh, 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 something uh, you know Willy Wonka. I don't know, man. You know. <laughs> So the Bible tells me to raise a child in the way he should go, the way he should go. Come on, mamas. Come on, men of God. Amen. But these are sins that we allow, we permit, right? We let them watch those types of movies, those types of shows. Oh, pastor's coming after my Netflix, and, and, and I'm coming after everything, too. I, I'll come after your prime. I'll come after it all. Amen. But you let them watch the shows and they're discipling them. They're trying to indoctrinate your children. Watch what they watch. And they let them be on YouTube till 1 o'clock in the morning. They go, they're, going, they're going to brainwash them. I'm talking about iPhone. That's my phone. I pay the bill. Come on, somebody. Amen, 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 amen. I'm talking about iPhone. I'm talking about my phone. That's my phone. Hey, iPhone. Stop, Josiah. I'm trying. <laughs> Impurity. Impure thoughts. got all kinds here. I, talk, I started writing a bunch. I was like, there's a lot out there, man. Jealousy. Outburst of anger. 
Selfishness. Hold on, I've got to keep writing. Selfishness. Know anybody selfish? Quite your point, sir. That was rude. I'm just joking. Amen. <laughs> selfish. Just trying to hear it, you know? Uh, drunkenness. Okay? It's not a sin to have a drink, but it is a sin to be drunk. Okay? You need to know that. Okay? So if you're like, well, then what is drunk? Do we go by the California limit? 0.000. Because <laughs> the Bible says a drunkard won't enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm just, I'm just Ryan. I'm, now, in case you say, where's he coming up with all this? Write this verse down. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 19. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So where's he getting this list from? Did he just Google it? It's actually the Bible, sir. <laughs> okay. The Bible says orgies. That's what it says. Okay. You're like, what's that? Don't Google it. <laughs> don't, don't Google that. Don't. Just read the Bible. It just reads. It says hostility. Right? You're hostile. You're just... You know, the Bible even says wild parties. That's what it says. Wild parties. You know, the club in Vegas where it gets wild up in here, up in here, up in here. <laughs> Dissension. You're a potster. You love that cheese, man. You love that drama. You just like, you just love, hey, did you hear what he said about you? Dude, if I, if I was, I mean, me personally, you're like... Why, why you stir the pot? Why are you the office pot stirrer? You're on the phone one hour with her, one hour with her. One, it's like, don't play yet because they're going to think I'm finished. I'm not. Okay. I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. Stand by. Okay. The Bible, says, the Bible says selfish ambition. I better move quick. The Bible says division, divisive. The Bible says sorcery. All Galatians 5, this is before the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. This is the fruit of the flesh, the scripture says. Sorcery. Well, I, I'm, not like, I'm not like no witch. Can I tell you that hor horrible scope is sorcery? Okay. Some of y'all believe more in your, your lucky days than the Lord's were. Oh, man, that, we're going after it today, huh? I'm after it today, huh? Sorry. Sorry. They gave me a coffee, and I was just like, man, what did they do that for? Sort this truth, yeah. Thank you. My wife said truth. It's true. You know, you're going tarot card readers, and and this this that's all demonic. It's, it's all demonic. It's, it's sin. God says, why are you going to someone else to tell you your future? Okay. He says, come to him. The evil eye and stones and 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 feng shui. It's like feng shui. It has to point this way. And what you need to do is point to Jesus. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah. Idolatry. You know, idols, again, you're like, I don't bow down to no idols. I ain't got, but some do, you know. You bow down to that paper. You bow down to that paper, man. You'll do anything. You'll desert your family for that paper. You know, Just idolatry, you know, uh, uh, jealousy. Uh, what else do I want to put here? Well, I want to put here. What else does the Bible say? There's a bunch. Let me just write all of them. Because <laughs> I will be here. Ten hours later. And I was like, amen. All of these. All this. What do we do with all of this? That if we look at this list, you're like, I got a lot of that. And if I rolled it out, it'd be like a CVS receipt. <laughs> Why are they so long? I, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> we all there. Yeah. Anyway. We'll deal with that one later. That should be on the sin list. I'm just joking. All right. <laughs> All of this. God says you're dead because of this. What do I do? What do I do with all of this? Because God is love, but God is just. Now, and again, I'm taking my time, so I don't want to confuse you. It almost, it almost, like, it's a paradox. God, you're love, but if you're all love, but you're still, you're still just. In other words, you deal with disobedience. Yeah. And disobedience requires punishment. And all the dads said, yeah. okay, so don't tell me. Be like, do whatever you want, son. Do whatever you want. Because I love you. 
You're like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna, we are going to regulate up in here. You know what I'm saying? Okay, where are my regulators at? Regulate? That's right. right. I'm inside. We're going to regulate up in here. Okay? You're like, you're so cruel. No, I'm a good dad. I'm, anyway, I better stop. Give me going down. It's not a parenting workshop, okay? But at the Silva home, just like I'm sorry, it's okay. We're working on listening the first time at the Silva home right now, okay? So it's just to let you know, okay? And I'm like, listen. Having electronics is not a, it is, it is a privilege, not a right. I went DMV on them. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Anyhow, focus just that. So, God is a good God. So don't think he's mean because he punishes disobedience. Mo- moms, can I get an amen? amen? He's a good God, right? Like you're a good mom by making sure they don't just run amok. Okay? They, 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 they need discipline, right? Please, because we see them at Target or we see them at Walmart. And I'm just, I better stop. Okay, so. <laughs> Someone say discipline. Okay. <laughs> discipline is love. Say discipline is love. The Bible says God disciplines those he loves. So God is in love, but he's just. He could not be God if he's all love. And that's why the movement of God, you know, we do this all in love. God is love. And then he's a big marshmallow. And he'll, he'll just let whatever. That, that is false doctrine. Yeah. Yes, he's love, but he's also just. Yeah. Okay. He will, he will deal with sin. Yeah. And it must be handled. Why? Because sin kills Sin steals. Sin destroys. What do we do with all this? Because all this deserves punishment. And we are all guilty of at least one or two or three, if not all of them on this list. All of us. Say all of us. Okay? And I'm a, all of us. Everyone up in here. Okay? okay. Every, every person, every pastor, everyone is guilty of this. And it, desi- it, it requires to be punished. Now you can play, brother. What do we do? Here's how good God is. Because the scripture says, verse 14 up there, that he forgave it. Remember I told you, it's a, it's a porterhouse. New York on one side, Philly on the other side. He canceled the record of the charges against us and he took it away by doing what? Nailing it where? To the cross. During this time, If you had a debt you could not pay and you owed a creditor, they would take your debt and they would nail it to your house, your front door, so that everyone would see you did not pay your debt and you had to leave it on there because you owed the debt. And if not, you'd have to give your life as a slave to pay off your debt. That's what God does. He says, I took your debt and I didn't nail it to you. Watch this, watch this. I didn't nail it to you. I didn't nail it to your home and to your house and to your children. But if we come to him, because salvation is free, but you got to come to him. He says, I grabbed it. And I didn't pin it on you for the rest of eternity. Because it had to be paid for. It had to be paid for. Someone got it. Someone, somebody has to pay for this. And he grabbed that. And the scripture says that he got this. I'm going to need some help right here. Come up here, Anthony. Help me out real quick. Come over here, bro. Because I, I, I might swing and knock this down. And uh, you got strength. So just hold the cross for me. Thanks, bro. Would you hold the cross for Jesus? Okay, appreciate you, bro. He grabbed it. And when he decided where he was going to nail it, the Bible says, where did he nail it? To the cross. However, I better do it right here. He nailed it to the cross. But here's where he gets gooder. Is that he canceled it. In other words, he made it go away. Because when he nailed it to the cross, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, that he bore in his body all of our sins. Every one of our sins, scripture says, 2.24, all of it in 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 his body. And he nailed it. So he held my debt, your debt, 
your brother's debt, your daughter's debt. He held, your, no matter how wicked that debt was, no matter how terrible that sin is, he bore that on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24, put it up there. Our sins, his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And the Bible says that by his wounds, we are healed. Okay, watch this. Man, I, I, I might not even contain myself. I might just run and fall on the altar myself. Because he held it metaphorically in his hand. And when the nail went through, it went through his hand, which then therefore caused blood to come out of his hand. And that blood began to run and cover our list. And because of his blood, it covered the list that was written on our debt. And now, and now it's clear, it's gone because he held my failures in his hand and he was willing to pay my punishment, to pay my price. That the whole reason why I can have a good Friday is because he took all of my failures my wickedness and nailed it not to my heart but to the cross and now I have a pathway to freedom healing in my heart you want to give God a praise cause I'm healed I said I'm healed I'm free I'm alive I'm alive cause I was dead The doctor can take away my physical sickness. A lawyer can help me in my legal battles. A CPA can organize my taxes. Vix can heal anything. <laughs> so my mom told me. But where do I take the condition of my soul? I take my spirit to? What do I take my sins to? My failures. It's only one place. It's only one. You can try to take that to different places. You can take it to Vegas. You can take it to an ungodly relationship. You can try it. Many have. Only to come up more empty than they were before broken. We've all been there. But there's one place. I said there's one place. I said there's only one. I said there's only one. There's only one. It's the principle of substitute. I should have been on that cross, but he was there for me. And I serve God not because I'm afraid of him. I serve him because he took my punishment. I'm not afraid that he's going to punish me. I serve him because he took my punishment. And that's why it's a good Friday. And if you haven't received that, you can give God a clap. And if you haven't received it, I want you to receive that tonight. Bow your head all across this room.